The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, my name is Carlo Tapia. I'm a product marketing manager at eFolder and your host for today's event. Welcome to the eFolder Expert Series. This webinar series brings together experts from eFolder staff and partner community for deep dive discussions on key service and technical topics. Today's presentation is how to back up and replicate offsite using eFolder VDR for Replicate. Today we are joined by Dave Stuffelbeam, Senior Manager of Sales Engineering at eFolder. So before we go into today's presentation, let's first cover a few housekeeping items. Uh, today's session is being recorded. The recorded version of the webinar will be made available on eFolder's YouTube channel. And we will also make copies of the slides available to those who registered for the event. <clears throat> With over 130 people registered for today's session, we've put all participants in listen-only mode. You can enjoy the audio portion of today's event by either streaming it on your computer or by dialing in over the phone. Uh, today's webinar follows a logical flow. After introducing our guests, we will take a look at four challenges MSP face with disaster recovery, or DDR. And then we'll briefly introduce eFolder BDR for Replivit, followed by a demonstration of setting up and configuring offsite backup for Replivit deployments. Finally, we'll discuss how partners can achieve success by backing up, uh, backing up and deploying eFolder BDR for Replivit, and answer any questions you may have. So while we have planned a special Q&A section at the end of today's discussion, uh, I strongly encourage you to submit questions throughout. Uh, so we'll be checking the question queue to make sure we answer along the way. Now let me introduce Dave. Dave Stuffelbeam is Director of Sales Engineering at eFolder. He brings over 20 years of technical experience to the channel team and is involved in technical consulting and partner support for the entire range of eFolder solutions. Work, working for companies like Macromedia, which is now Adobe, Corel, Novell, and Storagecraft, prior to coming to eFolder, uh, Dave has gained extensive and diverse technical knowledge with vast experience in cloud technology. Dave has presented to and performed technical trainings at companies like Walt Disney World, Pfizer, Procter & Gamble, Boeing, Walmart, and many more. Dave, uh, once again, thanks so much for joining us and welcome. It's always a pleasure. Thanks for having me again. All right. So uh, before we go into today's demo, which I'm sure will be an exciting one, um, I just want to cover some of the challenges that MSPs face today uh, with disaster recovery and with BDR solutions in general. <clears throat> the first one is just uh, the sheer cost of a BDR deployment today. Um, you know, there's, there's the very direct cost of BDR, uh, BDR deployments. Um, it, when you're talking about not only the BDR clients, but also the software as well as the storage costs, that can be pretty substantial if it's not priced right. Um, on top of that, you may have field deployed appliances or vendor-specific appliances that are difficult to upgrade or repurpose. Um, so you're sort of locked into the appliance that you purchase. Uh, a lot of BDR solutions today are dependent on a having a Windows operating system, and that alone can be an additional $400 or $500 to buy the operating system um, for building that BDR appliance. And so not only are you facing all of these upfront costs uh, when deploying a BDR solution, but oftentimes you're stuck with those costs because you're forced into a long-term contract or agreement, uh, where rather than going month to month and having the flexibility to move to a different BDR solution, uh, you may be stuck with that BDR solution and that appliance for a matter of years. <clears throat> The, uh, the next challenge partner space uh, is actually one that's, that's shared, by the, uh, shared by the industry in a lot of ways. It's uh, the way that backup has traditionally been done, which is this chain-based backup technology or incremental-based uh, backup technology. And uh, the, first thing, the, the first thing right off the bat is that when you have chain-based backup, it's very risky because what will happen is you'll have a single base image, and then from there, as you're adding on these chains, you have this sort of dependency on the last chain. And if that, anything ever happens, for example, one of those chains gets corrupted, every chain going forward will be mirroring that corruption. Um, 
Besides that, as you start adding more and more chains and become more and more dependent on having that base image, uh, you end up with these really lengthy chains that could be six months or a year, a year's worth of backups. Um, and then you, you, you may also be facing the problem where you have to reseed the base image periodically, which means going down, actually reset, uh, reseeding the, the image, having a, a tech go out and do this. And so from a labor standpoint, that can also be very expensive. <clears throat> Ongoing labor and management. So, um, you know, this, this really feeds off of the, uh, the chain-based dependency where besides the, re the, the reseeding of the data, verifying that these backups are actually uh, integral and that they're actually uh, proper backups and that they're going to work when you go uh, to recover your client's data. And so a lot of solutions today don't have automatic verification built in. So you may be backing up something that's already corrupted or has been corrupted at some point along the chain. Um, and if you have a very feature-like management portal that's not giving you a lot of insight into the backups and not giving you very substantial reporting, you're going to have trouble diagnosing those types of issues. Um, so poor reporting and then, and then integration of CSA tools. Every managed service, most managed service providers today, I should say, are using some type of CSA tool that they're, they're managing their labor with and doing their ticketing through. And so if you don't have really rich integration with your BDR solution and that PSA tool, that can add labor uh, to managing the solution. Uh, unreliable backups. Uh, you know, this is really the worst case scenario is that if you do have a corrupted chain and you don't have that management portal to really diagnose the problem, um, you haven't verified the backups, and then your client has some type of outage or downtime event, um, whether it's as simple as uh, a motherboard going bad or it's a site-wide disaster, and you go to recover that data and you discover that the backups were not done properly or that they were unreliable and you can't recover the data, that's the worst case scenario. You could potentially lose that client because that's what they're depending uh, on you for. Is, is In those worst case scenarios, are you going to be able to recover them? Um, and this is really the result that virtualization and recoverability is not actually tested by a lot of these BDR solutions. They're backing up, they're doing these backups of bad images um, and bad chains, and so you, you never really have confidence in, in the backups uh, that are taking place. So you could have a corruption of the op operating system, for example, that renders the backup entirely useless. <clears throat> Dave, anything to, uh, to add to some of the challenges the partners are uh, experiencing today? Um, no, I think you, you've done a great job covering it, covering it here. Um, you know, the, only, the only thing that I would add is you know, some of you who may know eFolder and know that we sell other image-based technology tools and that some of them are chain-based, um, I just want to clarify that, you know, even though chain-based backup can present risks, they do also, some of them out there, do have very reliable management utilities to check the chain dependencies and make sure that all the files that need to be there, all the images based, uh, the, image, the images that need to be there to recover are intact, but one of the, the things that they lack is data integrity inside the backups, which you were kind of leading to. So even though they may be checking the chain very well and let you know that your chain is intact, the data inside of the backup is probably more at what's at risk. And we're going to learn today how Replivit solves a lot of that problem. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. Uh, good insight, Dave. <clears throat> All right, so let's jump into uh, eFolder BDR for Replibit and talk about how uh, this new solution solves a lot of these problems. So uh, eFolder BDR for Replibit, uh, we announced just recently, and uh, it's a partnership between eFolder and Replibit. And uh, what we've built is a solution that's an end-to-end -end backup disaster recovery service. It bundles both the Replibit backup software uh, which includes that chain for backup technology with the massive cloud storage and recovery capabilities of the eFolder cloud. So for those of you online who are familiar with eFolder, this is very much in line with our strategy and approach of uh, partnering with leading backup vendors. Uh, so we have partnerships with Dell, uh, we have partnerships with Acronis, uh, Storage, Craft, Shadow Protect, uh, Shadow Protect or Nuveen. 
And so we partner with the and, and now Replicant, we partner with these leading vendors and bundle their software with our cloud. So that's what we've done uh, with Replicant. So this is a uh, this is how eFolder BDR for Replicant works. Um, you'll install the Replicant software on the server that you that you want to back up. You'll also install it on the BDR appliance that you're using uh, to back up that server. Now, 95% of the time, this is going to be enough. Uh, you're going to have the replicate uh, software and that BDR appliance on the site. And so in the event that there's ever some type of server outage or everyday disaster, you can use the BDR appliance that's on site to virtualize the server and get that client back up and running within minutes. Um, however, as part of the eFolder BDR for replicate service, we offer the off-site storage uh, which basically will use the BDR appliance to send images to the Replicate Vault, which is in the eFolder cloud. So we're storing those backup images in our cloud. Uh, you'll be able to access each of these uh, backups through the global management portal, the Replicate global management portal. And in the event of uh, a severe on-site uh, uh, on -site disaster or some type of natural disaster, that renders the BDR appliance and the server useless, you have all types of uh, recovery options that are available to you because the data is stored in our cloud. Uh, some of those options, uh, or, or the three options that you have available, the first is you can just download the images uh, back onto uh, uh, another server. Um, you can also have those images uh, sh uh, shipped to you, so we'll ship the images on disk. Um, and then finally, uh, we have an on-demand service through the eFolder Continuity Cloud. So this is your disaster recovery, uh, where you have a emergency in the cloud virtualization. So you can actually recover in the eFolder Continuity Cloud. Uh, some of the key features of Replibit is that it is chain-free uh, chain backup. So there's never a base image or dependent chains that, that have the potential to be corrupted. You're not going to have those redundant copies of data, so uh, it's not going to be a fool every time. It's going to be, um, uh, you're never going to need to ever receive the data center, and you're also not going to have these incremental forever or reverse incrementals or any incremental files. Dave, anything to add on the, the chain free backup technology and sort of the benefits uh, that the Replibit software provides in this respect? Yeah, a couple of things. You know, don't don't get confused with incremental files. The fact that it won't take incremental backups. So Replibit will take incremental backups. However, the technology that they use to store the the images on the the appliance that's the physical appliance located at the customer site, uh, there is a repository locally that the data is injected into. And this particular way of doing uh, of storing this data allows for uh, chain-free backup. So there still are, in, but for other technologies that would produce incremental type files with full backups, you know, and you store them on a traditional NAS device, you know, and a chain, one of the chain break, you know, one of those files break there, then yes, you're broken going forward. However, the way that Replivit stores it and stores those incrementals inside of a, of a, of a raw disk format on the um, appliance um, negates the need for chains, and so therefore uh, the chain-free backup or the, the, the no dependency chain is one of the main key features of, of, of Replibit, and, and also that's going to lower your total cost of ownership like Carlo, like you said before, with the ability not having to run out and rebase rebase machines and start chains over because the chain is, you know, 18 months or 36 months old and you're worried about data corruption in the chain. Great, great. And Dave, we do have a few questions uh, right off the bat here. Ryan, uh, Ryan is asking, is Replibit VSS aware? Does it offer uh, item level exchange recovery and does it work with SQL? So I, the first question I heard and the second question I heard, the, I missed the middle one. So the first one, is Replibit VSS aware? Um, yes, you can. It will take and notify the VSS framework in those applications like SQL. So that answers the third question, that is VSS aware will be notified of the backup. Um, and you can take VSS backups as often as your machine will do it. Replibit will take incrementals down to every 15 minutes. So if your machine is, you know, healthy and the VSS framework can, you know, 
get ready and take a backup, you can take it as often as every 15 minutes. What was the middle question, Carlo? My my phone cut out. Yeah, so so we answered the rest of the is VSS where it works for SQL. The middle question, or the second question was, uh, does it offer item level exchange recovery, so granular exchange recovery? Granular exchange recovery. Um, Replibit itself does not offer granular recovery uh, of, of mailboxes or items or emails. However, eFolder does offer a tool that works with that. It's actually the Kroll OnTrack. That's um, the, it's an amazing tool. I've been using it for years with, uh, you know, back in the day when I was at StorageCraft with Shadow Protect and now here with, you know, Shadow Protect here and Replibit. So it is a tool that is, um, you, it's a subscription-based tool available through eFolder uh, that, that, that you can get from us. Uh, and it's very, very inexpensive. Okay. And then, um, great. And Sam has a question. Uh, are offsite images compressed? Um, yes. I mean, the, the way that the data is stored inside of the repository, it, it's being stored in a way that it is compressed and um, basically deduplicated de as well. So the fact that you're never going to back up the same data twice, um, if, as long as it hasn't changed, uh, will also greatly help your <clears throat> greatly help your offsite storage. Um, you know, if you're if if you're worried about the offsite footprint and the cost of that offsite footprint, Carlo is going to cover um, the cost and how we bundle the licenses with storage. Uh, that's I think one of the main great features, the add-on that eFolder has done with the great Replibit technology, the way that we're bundling each license of Replibit with cloud storage that aggregates to the partner level. We'll cover that towards the end of the, the, the webinar here. Um, but it does, it, you, you almost don't need to worry about your cloud footprint. So it's going to give you predictable wholesale pricing, which then there's not going to be you know, surprises at the end of the month and you're going to be worrying about billing your customer that way. So you'll see that as we get toward, get going towards the, towards the end of the webinar here. Great. Okay. All right. Moving right along then. Um, so what are the, uh, the flagship features of Replibit that really saves a lot on labor and, uh, and verifying the integrity of backups uh, is the automated testing and screenshot verification uh, technology that's built into this. So what Replibit will actually do is that on a nightly basis, we'll automate the testing, boot up the VM, uh, so, so that, that image, um, and then take a screenshot of the, of the booted VM. So you know that the backup is actually working. And then on top of this, it, it also integrates with ConnectWise so that you can actually log the screenshot into a ticket. So we have partners who rather than have a tech out and have to set and periodically test these different uh, these different images, they can uh, he's he's now eliminated that entirely and just goes into ConnectWise and makes sure that the, the VMs are booted. Dave, anything to add here? Um, yeah, I just wanted to make sh make sh everybody aware that this is actually at the local site of the, v the virtual uh, machine booting and checking of the data integrity of the boot virtual machine in the eFolder cloud. This feature, even though um, for those of you who do know and understand Replibit, this is a feature that's also available on the vault. However, the vault that's provided um, by eFolder, this feature um, isn't enabled uh, simply because uh, um, the vault that you're given is is a virtual machine, and we, we don't have nested virtualization enabled. So booting virtual machines inside of a virtual machine is where I'm getting at. So this data integrity check is local only. Okay, great. Um, <clears throat> and uh, Danishka is asking, uh, does screenshot verification test all back the volumes or partition, or is it only the, vol the boot volume? Well, it's just a, it's a boot VM check, so it's going to boot the bootable partition and check the um, check to see if it did boot. Um, there's a, basically a time delay that happens. Um, once that time delay is is complete, you should hopefully be at that point if the machine is booting correctly. See the Control Alt Delete for the login, um, but it is it is just checking the boot partition because anything beyond that. Um, you know, it, it just it just boots it, 
checks it, takes a screenshot, shuts the VM down. Um, however, um, coming up uh, here shortly, we're going to talk about how Replivit uh, does data integrity checks on each of the volumes. That's right. So this is actually on the uh, on the next slide. Um, so uh, one of the uh, benefits of, of eFolio BDR for Replivit, and really the Replivit software, is these deep data verification checks. Um, so on a nightly basis, you're seeing a lot of the tests on the screen now, a lot of the tests that are run. So we have the boot VM snap, we, the resilvering of data. All of this really, all of these features that you're screening, uh, that you're seeing, really make sure that you're getting a proper backup and an integral backup. Um, uh, that's what's taking place here. Uh, on top of that, you're getting the, each of the incrementals injected into a virtual hard uh, disk. And so that's, that's going to verify that the backup is, uh, is actually complete. Um, Dave, which, which, uh, which data verification checks do you want to highlight? Well, I wanted to add um, that each time um, Replivit is actually backing up, it's, it's actually doing data integrity checks on every single backup. Um, some of this kind of appears to be kind of a nightly check, but this is also some of these checks are actually happening on every single backup. And you'll actually see, and, and this is where, you know, Carlo, you were talking about earlier about data verification, you know, in the, in the webinar here, that if, you know, during this, there's about a half a dozen checks that Replivit is going to do on every single backup before it will mark it successful. And if there's a certain threshold, that if that threshold isn't met, Replivit will actually fail the backup. And what that's going to tell you here and what, the, what to expect from Replivit is that the reason Replivit's going to fail the backup is simply because, like you said earlier, Carlo, there actually might be data inside of that backup image that is not valid. It may not boot. It may not be recoverable. So it is going to alert you saying, hey, you're backing this up, but I can't read it. I can't. It's highly defragmented. I can't see, you know, there's corrupted boot DLLs. You know, I can't guarantee that you're going to be able to virtualize this or recover this data later. So it's a very proactive approach into the data integrity checks inside of the backup and making sure that yes, I can cap or I can recover this data later. That happens on every single backup. So you may actually see Replivit fail backups on a machine that another image-based tool successfully takes backup on simply because it is not doing these data integrity checks on the data it's backing up. So I hope that I hope that makes sense, Carlo. It does. David uh, David is asking a follow up question then. So what do you do if uh, if you get a failed backup? Do you have to capture a new base? So because of Replivit uh, imposing these these really deep data verification checks and potentially having those failed backups uh, because of its high standard, uh, what what is the resolution when that happens, Dave? Well, the, the beautiful thing is, is no, you don't, you don't need a, to do a new base simply because there is no chain dependencies. Um, what's, typically what's going to happen is you'll dig into the, the logs, find out what is actually happening, uh, and then just you know, using your RMM tools, uh, hopefully be able to um, remote into that machine and you know, proactively go fix some of the errors or what's, hap you know, what's happening. Replibit's going to tell you why it's failing. Uh, most of the time, though, however, um, if a backup fails, it actually can be self-healing. And this is another feature that Replibit has with the deep ConnectWise integration. If you're a ConnectWise partner uh, and you are, you, you are using, you know, alerting systems to where, you know, hey, if something fails three times, then alert a tech. Uh, that's something that you can take advantage of with Replibit because not only does it just alert and open a ticket, it will, it will append tickets and it will even close tickets. So you may, you may watch a backup fail once and say, okay, you know, Replibit is self-healing, so it might have just been something really weird with the machine. Let's let it see if it's going to fail again. And on the third time, let's go ahead and alert a tech to go in, see what's happening, fix the machine, clean up the, the boot DLLs. A lot of times, uh, you know, it's it might be the, the the boot DLLs and you know new virus definitions and different things like that that are uh, causing causing the machine to maybe um, be corrupt, not corrupt, but that backup to fail. 
Uh, and then it's just a simple go in and, and then there's a best practices guide that Replibit has produced and eFolder has a version of that. Uh, and if you follow these best practices, and we actually are going to start teaching a best practices class here in the near future, where if you're following these recommended best practices uh, when deploying Replibit, that you'll actually prevent a lot of these failures from happening in the first place. So uh, Replibit's done a great job on their, their best practices in eliminating a lot of these problems ahead of time. Perfect. Okay. Um, so I, I mentioned some of the ConnectWise integration where uh, you could you could uh, attach the screenshot of the booted VM into a ConnectWise ticket, but on top of that, Replibit has very deep ConnectWise integration. So you're going to have a full range of alerts and tickets that you can open up, uh, as well as these customer agreement updates and uh, ticket generates at the service board of your choice. Uh, so uh, also the other we've had a few questions around um, what type of appliance you actually need then with Replibit, and the beautiful thing is that Replibit was designed on this uh, Linux Ubuntu hardened kernel that can run on basically any type of hardware. You're not going to need a Windows uh, operating system, so you, you don't have to uh, cough off the cough off that money. Um, and then the really cool thing about Replibit is that when, and we'll actually show this in the demo today, I believe that once you install the agent for Replicate, you don't have to reboot. So that's going to save you some labor as well. And each of the patching and updates happen automatically. David, anything to add here? Um, yeah, typ typically with the hardware agnostic, one of the things that I that Replicate likes to say and I, I, I agree with is that um, there is a software RAID controller inside of uh, the Replibit operating system. It does deploy its own operating system on the appliance and then all of the web GUI interface we're going to see here in just a moment. Um, but with that, um, now I totally forgot where I was headed. Um, oh, well, oh, the RAID the 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 controller. Exactly. Yeah, the RAID controller. controller. Yeah, so typically, typically, you know, depending on your appliance and, and the number of drive bays that you have available, you might do a typical hardware mirror or something on the OS. Um, that it does require a minimum of two drives. Um, that, and again, that's minimum, not recommended. But one for the operating system here, uh, you know, minimum 250 gigs or higher. Uh, and then definitely you want to do some form of a RAID with the data disk, the data partition, where all of these you know, images are going to be restored in the repository. Let what we typically recommend is let Replibit own that RAID configuration inside the operating system, uh, simply because they have proprietary resilvering of data uh, and they're constantly resilvering the data. And if they're managing the RAID controller, uh, the efficiency of the resilvering and making sure and verifying the data is intact uh, is much more efficient. Um, so, uh, so that's that, that the that I would add question there. that. That answers Dan's question then, that you, you don't actually need a RAID controller with Replibit. No, you, it can be deployed without a RAID controller. <clears throat> um, but if you are going to use a RAID controller, especially one that um, where you are going to RAID the actual um, data store or the data disks, um, then you would want a RAID controller that supports JBOD, just a bunch of disks. Um, so that it will be seen, uh, so that you'll see the multiple drives being presented. Otherwise, Replibit will not see all the drives inside of the RAID, and if one of them's bad inside the Replibit operating system, they wouldn't be able to tell you which one. So this this gets back again to the best practices guide and different things that we we um, you know we can send to people or they can download uh, directly from our web portal too. Okay, good. Um, so this is uh, this is how uh, the the bundle breaks down. You know, we're bundling that powerful Replibit software with all of the features that we just covered, uh, and then we're, we're bundling it with eFolder Cloud Services. So that's both the storage aspect and also those disaster recovery capabilities. So that with this bundle, you can deliver to your deliver to your clients an end-to-end -end business continuity solution. Um, 
so on that note, uh, I do want to get into the demo with, with what time we have. Um, so, Dave, I'm going to go ahead and make you the presenter. Okay. Give me just a second here. Okay, Carlo, let me know when you're seeing my uh, Replibit screen here. Yep, we got it. Okay, just to kind of set the stage, um, I am in a demo environment that's uh, actually virtualized. Um, again, when you deploy Replibit, it's not supported, a Replibit vault, it's not supported uh, deployment on a virtual appliance. It is supported on physical. Um, so don't follow my footsteps here where I'm in a VMware environment and, and everything else. But I'm actually on um, a, a, a fake Active Directory server. This would be, I've already got the uh, appliance deployed, uh, but I don't have it configured. So let's go ahead and log in and look at the Replibit appliance. Um, another, another feature of this that we haven't talked about yet is Replibit has a licensing portal as well. So when you obtain licensing from eFolder, you'll get credentials into a Replibit licensing portal. From there, you'll be able to go in and create customers and their locations inside the licensing portal uh, and then assign licenses to that particular customer or even unassigned licenses from a customer. So um, I have already done the licensing portion of this. Um, we've got documentation around that if you want to see that. But I'm going to, I'm going to log in as an administrator on the, um, or just a user on the appliance itself. Again, this is the um, appliance that is at the customer site. So the first thing that it shows is the dashboard of the protected systems. I don't have any protected systems. This is a fresh install of a BDR. Uh, you can change the name of the BDR here uh, by going into the settings. And I recommend, especially if you're going to use our global management portal, I definitely recommend changing the machine name to represent, you know, the customer name slash, you know, location and the word BDR or what have you, simply because it makes it more identifiable uh, in the management portal. Um, and by default, it says, you know, like replibit.com or replibit.local or something like that. I think it's .com. Uh, but again, um, you, everything is fully configurable, uh, you know, even to the logo, to, you know, different users other than admins that can log in and be able to access the, 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 the appliance locally. Um, uh, and then we'll, we'll go through some of this. We don't have time to go through all of it. But the main part that I wanted to show you here was, on the protected systems, we don't have a system, um, you know, and a system backing up today, uh, right now on this appliance. So what we're going to do is this: I'm actually on the machine that I need to uh, deploy the agent on. So I'll just go down to the downloads, and I'll download the actual Replibit agent. Um, it's just give me typical Windows Server error here, uh, and from here I'll just go ahead and run the Replibit installer. <laughs> Maybe. There we go. And it's very simple. Again, you're going to be on the local area network uh, when you, you install this. So you're going to look for the local appliance IP. It can take, um, excuse me, um, it can, I think, take a host name here as well. Um, just make sure your DNS is configured correctly. And then this is the encryption password. This step is actually really, really important for eFolder. If you plan to offsite this data to the eFolder cloud, the encryption option here is actually required, not optional. Um, Replibit is sold in, in, in a couple of different models, um, but in the model that it's sold in with eFolder is the model that Carla was just talking about, the fact that you are going to offsite this for offsite disaster recovery. It's our policy and our data center, any data that we receive that is unencrypted, we will actually uh, destroy. So you definitely need to do this step or you're gonna be reseeding, uh, reseeding this uh, data. We'll go ahead and hit next here. 
uh, and just a quick a quick install and within 10 seconds here we should be done installing the agent now for those of you who have deployed other image based backups tool tools typically you're not doing this stuff until after 5 p.m. or on the weekend or what have you it is actually kind of you know a no-no to come in during production hours and install uh, an image based backup tool simply because it's installing a snapshot driver which then integrates with the VSS framework which then causes the machine to have to be reboot rebooted Replivate has done an amazing job at getting to the point to where they can install all of everything that's required for the you know the image based tracking of you know the sector based tracking and everything else like that without having to to reboot the system so let's go look again at the protected systems we'll see here that we have the epic uh, active directory server and right now uh, this machine only has one hard drive uh, for just for simple demo purposes and we're on the default schedule here so let's go ahead and quickly look at building out or looking at editing the default schedule. In fact, why don't we go ahead and just create a schedule and we'll just call this um, um, you know, 8 to 6 p.m. backups. Um, I can make this the default if I want to, but I'm not going to. So the initial backup time, this is actually, I think this is a fantastic feature because again, this, this helps towards your total cost of ownership. A, I can deploy the agent while the machine is up and running and now B I can go set what time I would like the full backup to start backing up so that means now my tech can go deploy this at 8 o'clock in the morning you know rack the BDR appliance deploy the agents and then schedule the full backup to happen at 6 p.m. after everybody has gone home and then if the full backup doesn't happen to be complete by the time everybody comes back we can actually pause the full backup at 7 a.m. so this this only affects um, when I'm taking a base image or I'm taking the backup for the first time then after that I can choose the incremental schedule whether I'm going to do a manual schedule where I log in and I just kick off kind of a one-time incremental every now and then or I do a schedule base and at this point, we're going to go ahead, since the name of the backup is from 8 to 6, we'll just choose from 8 to 6 p.m. and do it every hour on the hour. If you want to get um, down to less than that, we can change it to minutes, and then we can do it every 30 minutes or every 15 minutes. But we're just going to do this every hour on the hour and get 11 backups, uh, 11 backups a day. So we'll save this. I now I have two, two different schedules. We'll go back to the protected machine and very simply I can change to the default, you know, not the default, but the new, the new schedule that I've just taken. When I was learning, you know, coming from a storage craft background and, you know, if I did a continuous incremental and killed the continuous incremental and set up a new schedule or started over, that means a new base. Here, because of the way the data is stored in the repository in the ZFS file system and every, all the magic behind Replibit, uh, it just takes on the new schedule. Uh, so I can create an infinite amount of schedules uh, and then change the machine uh, to a different schedule without having to rebase, without having to reseed. So it's, it's, it's a beautiful thing here. Um, another thing that we want to do here um, is we'll just go into actions. And while, while, we're, while we're talking here, we don't have any snapshots. Nothing's been taken. So I'm going to go ahead and schedule the initial backup while while we're talking here this is just a base operating system so hopefully this will happen very very quickly um, while that's while that's happening we actually can go check the status of the job here um, and just click refresh this doesn't dynamically update uh, but as soon as the machine um, as soon as this kicks off we'll see the progress of the backup job here we'll actually can see you know once we turn on the vault um, and we start to replicate to the vault, we'll be able to see the history um, of that and then if there's a current one happening as well. While we're waiting for that to kick off, let's go ahead and connect to the vault. Now, this is the eFolder, um, this is the eFolder vault. This is the portion where eFolder comes in. Right now, everything is locally, it's being backed up locally, stored locally, verified locally. 
Now we, what we want to do is provide that offsite disaster recovery solution. So this also is another thing that you're going to do. You're going to come in um, to your vault. Let me come here to this other tab here. You're going to come into your vault ahead of time um, and make sure that it is provisioned. Um, my login timed out. Give me just a minute. So you're going to make your make sure your vault is provisioned. Um, you know we have sales engineers and support people that help make sure that this is all uh, you know good and working and everything else like that. But you can see we actually have um, some other um, some other backups happening from different systems uh, from a different demo environments. So keep in mind that the Replivate vault is actually dedicated to you as an MSP, but it is a multi-tenant vault. So you can send more than one customer to a single Replibit vault. So let's go ahead and add that vault. So we're just going to call this the E folder rep, if I can type correctly, Replibit vault. And in the IP address, just to keep things fast here, I've just got the host name. You'll be assigned a host name and credentials to get into the vault. Um, the vault is also tied. Um, this is another piece, though. The vault is also tied to the licensing portal. And there's actually some key things around that, because as I create customers and users in the licensing portal and I add the vault to the licensing, there's actually security built around that, even though that this is a multi-tenant vault. Let me show you here. We'll just go into, we'll pick one of the random machines. I'm logged in as an administrator on the vault. Um, but notice, I don't have access to virtualized terminal mount or export or start an iSCSI target. I would actually have to log in as the user in the license that was created in the licensing portal. There's a username and password associated with the, with the customer. Um, and for me to be able to get access to this data, I need to log in as that user. So right now, I'm just logged in as a physical administrator of the vault but not actually managing the data for that particular customer. And this is actually really key for secure, you know, data protection and security in a multi-tenant server. So I'm just going to pick all here um, for the, the, you know, just every day of the week, starting at uh, 12 and ending at 12. And then I need to choose a, a bandwidth um, for going up to the cloud. So um, this environment, this, uh, you know, this customer has a pretty good bandwidth. So we're just going to go ahead and say five megabits up and click save. Now, to get this machine um, to actually replicate to this vault, um, and I know, I know this question is going to be asked, so I'm going to answer it here. I can add more than one vault. However, I can only replicate a single machine to a single vault. I can't. If I have vault A and vault B here, machine number one can only go to Vault A or Vault B, not Vault A and Vault B, okay? So keep in mind that um, I, I can have more than one vault, but I can only send a machine to one vault. Um, so let's go back to the protected systems here and go into the detail view. And now here is where I can come in and turn on the replication. Now that we have a vault um, uh, you know, that we've created or added, um, you can ena enable vault seeding, that's you know, the ability to seed to a drive, which so when you're shipping data to eFolder, you do have the ability to upload over the wire or also send seed drives uh, to our data center. You will, you will open up a support ticket if you're going to seed via drive to us, um, and uh, we'll be able to seed that locally over the local area network. I can also choose a snapshot to be used as the base here. So if I have, if I have had like a long history, this has been backing up for a while. Maybe you're a current Replibit user from Replibit, and you're looking at eFolder as an offsite. Um, the, and you could actually choose a snapshot from today or yesterday to be the base image uh, that's actually going to be sent up to the eFolder cloud, and then you only have like a small. Uh, once that's up, you would only have a small set of you know, data that actually needs to be replicated back up. So since we don't have, I don't even know if my base is done yet, I'm just going to hit save here. And now this is going to be set as, um, 
you know, being replicated to the E folder vault. And here again is where I would click and enable that boot VM check. But because I have the um, the uh, encryption enabled, I've got to tell you know, and that was at the agent. I've got to tell the BDR um, what the encryption password is here. And then now, sometime around two o'clock in the morning, this machine will boot and do the login screen check shot. Uh, and again, if I have in integration set with um, ConnectWise, that will actually be embedded. But there are also uh, the ability, if you're not a ConnectWise partner, there is also the ability to uh, send that via an email message. Uh, and you could send that to maybe like a, like a tier one tech or a receptionist. And when they come in in the morning, they can just check all the emails, see if the screenshot was great. If, if it doesn't, if you don't see a login screen, you might see, you know, the blue screen of death if the machine was having problems. You might see a, you know, just a, a black boot screen where nothing's happening yet. It's those kinds of screenshots that you want to take and alert maybe the tier one, tier two, tier three techs that, hey, something might not be virtualizing correctly with this particular uh, machine. Um, all right, so let's go back and look at our jobs here and see if uh, this thing is backing up. It is. We can see it's at 36%. I was hoping that maybe I would be able to virtualize this particular snapshot just to show you that if you wanted to test virtualization. So what I'm going to do, um, I'm actually going to jump over to another appliance that's in this, a uh, Replibit appliance that's in this same environment uh, backing up a different virtual machine here. So just I can quickly show kind of a full circle here of, you know, being backed up and then also maybe virtualizing or, you know, presenting a, a snapshot for use. That's if I type the password correctly, which is funny because it's just the default is admin and password. Um, okay. So here we're going to go into the file server. We'll go into the details of the file server. And I can scroll down here um, and look at the snapshots. If we look at use snapshots, there really isn't anything in use right now. But if I had a machine that was virtualized or mounted as an iSCSI target, we would see those uh, used snapshots here. So let's go look at the available snapshots. We can see a whole bunch of ones from today. I'm just going to pick one randomly here, and I'm just going to tell it to virtualize. Now, there are two modes that you can, um, you can use when, when uh, booting up a VM. It's test mode and live mode. Live mode is for true failover, you know, short SLA failovers if a machine is dead down, dying, and bleeding, and you need to restore business continuity and actually fail over the snapshot, you can do that here. Uh, test mode disables the, the network interface card, and so therefore you're not going to have two machines on the same network, uh, and away you go. Um, and so I just need to put in the um, encryption key here, and we'll hit start, and then eventually a RAM cannot exceed 3.8. So let's go ahead and just give it three, probably just because the amount of RAM I have on the virtual, the virtual appliance here that I have. So the virtual machine is started, and oh, I need to come in and allow pop-ups from this particular server. Uh, and that may have actually blocked it, but that's okay because now I can come in to the used snapshots, and I'll see that snapshot that I virtualized, and now I can open up the terminal and get a VNC session right to the snapshot that I virtualized. And something to keep in mind here, when I, when I virtualize either in test mode or either in, in, in live mode, especially live mode, it's, it's really important that any data changes that happen actually stay persistent to this point in time. So if you are virtualized in a failover mode, keep in mind you're already in a virtual disk and the changes are persistent. So failing back actually is fairly easy, uh, and you don't even need to back up this particular instance if you are um, virtualizing that point in time. So I think, Carlo, that's, you know, with time sakes, we have about 10 minutes left. We need to, you have a few slides plus Q&A. Um, I think that's probably where I'll, I'll leave this. Um, let's, let's move forward. Okay, great. Um, yeah, let's, 
let's move forward. There's a, there are a ton of questions that came in, but um, I do want to get through these slides, and then we can answer all those on the Q&A slide. So let me switch back to my screen. Uh, okay, and Dave, you let me know when you see it. It's up. Okay, great. So uh, we talked about a lot of the features that you're going to get with eFolder BDR for rep a little bit, that chain-free backup technology, deep data verification checks, the automated screenshot. Um, it is a hardware agnostic solution you, it, because it's built on that Linux Ubuntu kernel. Um, OS independence, so you're not going to need the, the license for the appliance itself. Um, so just a, a bundle of great features here. Uh, the one thing um, that's very important to mention is that eFolder has adopted a model with a lot of its BDR solutions, and this one uh, is, is not excluded. eFolder BDR for us a bit offers gener very generous amounts of cloud storage. So we bundle in with our eFolder BDR for Replicate offering two terabytes of cloud storage. We did a survey earlier this year on how much uh, typically a server is, uh, uh, how much data is actually being backed up to our cloud per server, and it's usually about 250 gigabytes. So taking that into consideration, two terabytes of storage in the eFolder cloud is going to give you a lot of room and space to, to grow and scale your business continuity practice. The other thing I'll mention here is that this is two terabytes per server. So um, that storage is actually pooled at the partner level. So if you have uh, three server licenses of eFolder BDR for Replibit, you'll actually have six terabytes across, uh, across those three servers in the eFolder cloud. Um, so pooled at the partner level. Um, again, this is, uh, this is how we go to market today, uh, basically offering um, different types of, of uh, backup solutions. Um, besides Replibit, we do also offer our Cronus, Dell Aperture, StorageCraft, ShadowProtect, and, and Veeam. Um, so if, in case you're interested in those other flavors, those options are available to you today. Going back to Replibit, this is how, uh, this, is, this is just a general overview. It starts at $65 per server. That's going to include your backup agent software, your appliance software, global management portal software, and the two terabytes of cloud storage per protected server in the eFolder cloud, as well as access to all those different disaster recovery techniques, whether it's download, disk shipment, recovery in the eFolder continuity cloud, um, and also you can always virtualize on-site using a BDR appliance. <clears throat> Just going into the pricing a bit more, it is volume-based pricing, so the more server licenses that you purchase, you will actually start seeing a discount in your per-server cost. But it starts at a minimum commitment of three servers or three server licenses. That's $65 per server, and you're looking at two terabytes per server, so six terabytes. Once you start moving up those 10 servers, 50 server licenses, you, you will start realizing that discount. All right, so loads of questions in the question queue, um, and I'll lean on you, Dave, to answer a lot of these. Um, okay, uh, so Andre is asking, can you virtualize the image in the eForge Cloud in case there's an issue with virtualizing it locally? So I did cover this, Andre. Um, so. In the event of an everyday disaster, 95% of the time you will want to use that BDR appliance uh, that's on site because that's your most immediate recovery technique. However, because you store, you're storing the images in the eFolder cloud and because you have access to the eFolder continuity cloud, you can virtualize um, you can virtualize that server in our cloud. So that is an on-demand service that's available to you. Um, the other question, uh, we have a few people asking about auto-task integration. So Dave, my understanding is that right now Replibit uh, does not have integration with auto-task, but if there's anything uh, that you want, you want to add or elaborate on? Yeah, I've, I've been asked that many times, and I've asked Replibit themselves. Um, it's on their roadmap. However, they don't have an official ETA on that. Um, they're, I think the official answer I was given was hopefully um, by the end of the year, but 
I cannot like I cannot guarantee that, and neither can can Replibit. So it is it is on the roadmap, and I know they've started. I believe they've started some development on it, but um, there is no ETA on it just yet. Great, great. Uh, Curtis is asking, can you set retention in your vaults? And if so, what are the options? Um, yeah, Dave, that's a great question, and I can't. I can't believe I didn't cover that. That's actually one of the um, good benefits of Replibit is that I can set a local retention. Um, if, so if you remember, I was going over on the protected systems page and going into the details. Um, in that screen, there is the number of snapshots that I wish to um, actually keep. I can set that both locally and then on the vault, I can log in, go to the protected systems page, go to the details, and then choose how many uh, how many snapshots or, or you know, uh, that I want to keep uh, re remote as well. The benefit to that, because of the chain, the lack of chain dependency, um, I truly can drop off points in time. So eventually, if I say, yeah, keep keep 120, 120 backups a day, or 120 backups total, and I'm taking 10 backups a day, I can truly keep 12 days worth of backups, and eventually the snapshot that was my original full, that point in time for recoverability will actually be dropped off uh, um, and you won't be able to recover that point in time anymore. So it, it is a true first in, first out type of chain dependency. Good question. Perfect. Um, Denisha is asking, can you deploy Replibit without a BDR appliance? My understanding is that you cannot. But there is another uh, gentleman asking. Sam is asking, can you uh, can you back up to a NAS device? So Replibit, 100% of the time, requires an appliance, and this the simple reason why is because the Replibit, you know, the Replibit software that actually does all of the backup and stores the repositories and you know has the web GUI deploys to deploy that. I deploy an operating system, and it's their own version of Ubuntu hardened 12.04. So I do need some kind of physical appliance. Now in my environment that you are seeing, I'm, I'm actually on a VMware ESX environment and it is virtualized. However, um, if that's not supported by Replibit nor by eFolder as well, it does need to be on physical hardware um, to, to be deployed. Um, so there also, you can go to ubuntu.com slash certification. Um, that, that website will give you the ability to check the, the hardware compatibility based on the Ubuntu 12.04 hardened kernel that we were talking about. Um, and then what was the other half of that, that, the second question, Carlo? Oh, it was um, NAS device. Do you, can you back oh, up NAS, NAS device. device? The answer is um, no. It actually has to be that local storage. I can, uh, you know, I can export out a backup to a NAS, uh, but you're you're basically creating, uh, you know, with the Replibit appliance. If you have a NAS that is a server, you could just install the Replibit software on that NAS type server to box. I mean, not a traditional toaster type NAS would it work, but if you have a, a server that's a dedicated NAS box. And it has the RAM and the hard, you know, the CPU and the hard disks, and it's compatible with Ubuntu. You might as well just turn your NAS into a Replibit appliance. Uh, but otherwise, no, I cannot pass out uh, simply because Replibit stores all of the data in the DFS file system, and I can't control the file system on the NAS. Perfect. And this may uh, that may have answered Curtis's question. He's asking. Um, He's asking about possibly a hospital or a medical client. They need to store their data for up to seven years, and so he's wondering if you can attach some type of external drive and store it there. Um, and maybe, I, I, maybe a follow-up question is: Can you have different retention policies for different uh, appliances that you have attached? So um, each protected machine can have its own different retention. The retention is uh, is basically by agent versus by appliance. Um, if you have enough data or enough storage space in one machine, then yes, you can keep enough data for seven years of compliancy. You just put the number of days that is that you want to keep snapshots. 
the, uh, another beautiful thing that Replibit can do is if you outgrow a Replibit appliance, you can migrate the data uh, to another Replibit server and keep the backup chain and keep everything going. Uh, so that's another option to think, you know, to think about, you know, long term, seven years worth of data. That might be actually kind of hard to predict out what it's going to look like. So you may want to, um, you know, predict a three year or a five year type projection and then look with, at the possibility of upgrading if you have to. So um, I hope that answers the question. It's per agent, per, per protected system. Um, and then you can migrate the data. Um, and you can run Replibit in a cluster mode, but, um, and move, move from, you know, move machines being protected by different Replibit appliances. But that is a whole nother technical discussion and we can't get into it in this call. <laughs> okay, so Bob is asking, and I think this is a really good question. Can we re redeploy current Shadow Protect BDRs with Replibit? There's also another, a uh, person asking about data BDRs. So maybe, um, Dave, you want to go ahead? Yeah, you can repurpose pretty much the, the, the beautiful part about the Replibit operating system. It is an Ubuntu 12.04 hardened kernel. So there is a wide support of, of hardware, um, and you can repurpose uh, hardware. So if you do have Shadow Protect or Acronis BDRs or even data boxes, uh, I ask the question to the Replibit team, does, you know, Replibit pretty much install on um, pretty much every data device out there? And the answer I got was, yeah, for the most part, it will. Uh, the only one that it won't is probably the Dado Alto device, which is the really, really small uh, kind of, you know, little box that sits on the desk. Uh, it doesn't have enough compute power, but for the most part, the, the different data models and older BDRs, or even if you're going to retire a file server or something to that effect because it's outlived its usefulness, it's a good chance you could turn that into a, a, a Replibit BDR. Okay. Um, just uh, some other questions. I know that we're, we're over the hour, but uh, we do have a lot more questions, so we'll try and just tackle a few more. Um, if uh, Michael is asking, is there is ever some type of disaster event and the data does need to be overnighted to him, uh, does e folder charge for that? The, the from my understanding, the only charge is um, will you you pay for it as fast as you want it shipped to you. Um, we have a Delta Dash account. I I, I believe it's just the shipping charges. Um, I don't think there's a hostage fee uh, for that. If there is, I believe it's as small as like 100 bucks or 125 bucks or something to that effect. But for the most part, everything that I've heard is, you know, you just pay, you just pay for the shipping of the data. Okay. And uh, Christian is asking, um, can we have retention schedules like StorageCraft, last 30 days, last 12 months, last eight years, or do we need to keep each day for the last? Seven years. Um, well, we kind of we kind of have covered that. It is actually, you know, the number of snapshots that you want to keep versus how many snapshots you're taking a day. And then, you know, if you want to keep 30 days worth of data um, and you're taking 10 backups a day, you got to keep 300 snapshots to be able to to accomplish that. So that I mean, it, it's based on the number of archives. It really isn't based on the number of days or months or years or what have you. Okay. And the number of snaps and the number. So, yeah, sorry, I already said that. Go ahead, Carlos. Um, no, Danushka is just asking, um, we need support regarding Replibit deployments restoration. Should we contact EFO or Replibit? So I'll take this one. Uh, part of the benefits of partnering with eFolder on this solution is that um, everything from support, uh, whether that's sale, technical, uh, marketing, everything is done through eFolder. So um, uh, we have our own support organization, and by purchasing the solution through us, you'll be able to tap into that. Uh, and you won't have to balance two different vendors. Uh, eFolder will support you in your in your deployment or recovery or installation or whatever it may be. So. Um, Okay, good. Well, uh, 
on that note, uh, Dave, unless there's anything else you'd like to add, um, I'll go ahead no. and... Uh, I'm good. Thanks so much. Okay. All right. Well, thank, I, I want to, first of all, thank, uh, thank today's expert, Dave Stuffelbeam, uh, Director of Sales Engineering here at eFolder. And then I also want to thank uh, everybody who joined today's call. Um, I think it was a very productive webinar, and uh, all of the questions that came in were good, and we, we hope that we answered uh, most, if not all, of them. Um, so on behalf of uh, eFolder, uh, my name is Carlos Tapia. Uh, have, have a very good day.